With the recent news of Fallout 76 just on the horizon, and a glimpse into the first time we've seen a Fallout title reach for a multiplayer audience, news that has the whole gaming world ablaze. Most of you came here for one thing. Todd Howard! Thank you. How will a Fallout game look in a multiplayer format? Well, actually, this wasn't the first time someone tried to take a Fallout-like post-apocalyptic setting and make a game that was a multiplayer game, or even an MMORPG. Enter Fallen Earth, created by an unknown studio in Icarus Studios, an MMORPG that promised to be just that, a post-apocalyptic take on the MMORPG world, one that emphasized player freedom and choice above all else. Despite the unique take on the MMORPG market, however, Fallen Earth was unable to garner anything more than a mediocre response. Perhaps for such a small studio, Icarus's idea of going straight for the sun with glued on wings wasn't the best option here. Let's take a trip to the desolate wasteland located around the Grand Canyon and uncover the trials and tribulations of the ambitious Fallout-like MMORPG, Fallen Earth, where war, well, war sometimes changes. The story starts in North Carolina, home to the independent studio behind Fallen Earth, Icarus Studios. There's not much info on who Icarus Studios was, but we do know that they had the intentions of releasing a MMORPG titled Fallen Earth as early as 2008. A press release of an alpha testing hit the web on August. Virtually coming out of nowhere, Fallen Earth was set to launch September 22nd, 2009. As described in the same press release, Fallen Earth was to combine the accuracy of a first-person shooter style game with the depth and character advancement of a role-playing game. The game featured a classless advancement system, a real-time crafting system, etc, etc. Apparently players could create as much as 95% of the game's items, there were 6 unique factions, 70 towns, and more than a thousand square kilometers of a zoneless territory with no loading screens to explore. It was surely sounding like it had the potential to be the online world that Fallout hadn't been. A Fallout MMO. Now that's an interesting idea. And so people hoped that Fallen Earth could scratch that itch. Let's go on some noobs. As announced, Fallen Earth launched on September 22nd, 2009 for the PC. Sales that according to this old and gadget article saw it in the second place of direct to drive sales. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time over Ion even. Despite its moderate sales success, however, both the critics and the audience weren't rating the game above a C grade. In unison, everyone was happy to see a post-apocalyptic MMORPG, especially as fantasy had nearly always quite dominated the space. Fallen Earth had a fantastic world and certainly felt immersive. However, the issues people outlined were concerning the game's clumsy combat and poor animations, not to mention a plethora of bugs. These are all issues you typically expect from an indie company doing an MMO using their own in-house engine. Issues further expounded upon in Fallen Earth as the game and servers suffered from terrible rubber banding lag, not unlike most MMORPG launches, however. Oh shit, holy shit. That is some laggy shit. What Fallen Earth lacked in polish, however, it tried to make up for in pure charm. Nearly every character you would encounter on your journey in Fallen Earth all looked unique. That's quite a rare feat for an MMORPG, especially one the size of Fallen Earth, or the size of its budget at least. With six factions and sub-factions within each of them, the NPC factions really helped you customize your characters even more. But sometimes the reason for a game dying aren't so difficult to find out. Sometimes you find the murder weapon, sometimes you find blood all over the place with the DNA of the culprit, and no use overcomplicating things. It was no secret that Fallen Earth had a major problem with polish. This is something that a company can sometimes fix through a solid year of focus post-launch. But Fallen Earth had more than just polish issues. The very engine itself seemed to struggle to run the game. And here's where we run into the yet again a reoccurring issue in an MMORPG of a game engine not being something that you can just easily make drastic changes to. Once you launch with your given game engine, it's not like you can hit the reset button and just start over. Not really, at least. What you have at launch and onwards, give or take, is what you're going to have. Sure, you can make strides in the engine and coding and polishing things up like animations and graphics and UI, but in the case of Fallen Earth, coming from an indie studio with all signs of having a minuscule budget, especially in relation to other people in the marketplace at the time, and especially for an MMO of the scope that Icarus wanted to achieve, 
It's a case of not having the resources and tech to really accomplish the vision that you want to accomplish. Yeah, how do you like that? Yeah, some too. Fuck you. And you. Yeah. Fallen Earth wasn't your traditional MMORPG. Besides the game being one of the first attempts at a post-apocalyptic Fallout-esque MMO, it also, like you would expect in such a game, emphasized heavily into player choice and autonomy. Even almost to a certain detriment, Fallen Earth wasn't really a traditional MMORPG that focused so heavily on endgame. Leveling took longer in the game, and the game attempted to give you, the player, more invested into their personal character. Icarus wanted players to take time getting to endgame, to enjoy the journey of leveling and not just obsess with the end goal. We can argue to some level that the end game is important, and Fallen Earth has some of that in the form of in game PvP and the occasional more difficult quest, but it wasn't such a large focus of the game. Although this can be problematic for your game losing its wheels once people reach max level, however. I understand why Icarus didn't focus so heavily on it. In many MMOs, players are just focused on rushing to the end game as fast as possible, because the majority of the game is played at max level. Fallen Earth had a different idea of how to make their game. It was more about minute to minute gameplay, starting from as early as level 1. It's not rocket science to imply that perhaps a bit more end game content, Fallen Earth maybe could have kept its loyal player base that much longer. But I don't think that's what the devs behind Fallen Earth were worried about. This was set to be a game where you, the player, could choose how to play the game and choose how to build your character. Midway into the game, you would choose a faction to join, or not. Playing neutral was actually a way to play the game, it was a supported faction. And once you joined a faction, this meant that other factions were closed off to you, especially factions that were antagonistic towards your faction. So choice was more than just wearing a mohawk with a biker jacket. It was joining an anarchistic group of government haters and embracing that, or maybe joining a faction that was all about maintaining order. How you wanted to play the game was up to you. But this is where Fallen Earth ran into the same issues a majority of sandbox games had to experience at some point. And that's the fact that a majority of players in the MMORPG market, as proven by what our current successful MMOs are, want some level of handholding. They want some level of theme park. The majority of players don't want the onus of fun on them, the player. Instead, they want to have their hand held for a certain amount of time. This means that for a title like Fallen Earth, they have to realize early on that they're a niche product, and never waste resources to try and overly prove otherwise. There's nothing wrong with making a sandbox have more hand-holding, as long as it doesn't take away from the core experience of the game. So a better UI or new player experience is useful no matter what kind of game or difficulty level. And these are issues that Fallen Earth had. This is where we circle back to the core issue behind Fallen Earth, however. It might have had all of the customization and difficulty we would expect in a post-apocalyptic MMORPG, but playing a game shouldn't feel difficult for the sake of feeling difficult. When you find yourself fighting with the gameplay engine and fighting against bugs, it really detracts from the experience. When an already tough and hardcore game has tough and hardcore bugs, it makes the whole experience just feel tough and the juice not really being worth the squeeze. It doesn't matter how deep the experience of your game is, if people can only sometimes experience that to its fullest, consistency is king, and that's why polish has proven to be the major key in an MMORPG success. Just look at World of Warcraft. The summer of next year, May 2010, just a little less than a year after Fallen Earth's launch, news hit the internet that detailed that Icarus Studios would be cutting a portion of their workforce. This number would amount to as many as 75 people, which was nearly three quarters of their workforce. When reached out to, Icarus's marketing manager stated that subscriptions were doing well, and the game was planning a large content patch such as PvP arenas. But what also accompanied the layoff news was news that the co-founder of Icarus and standing CEO, James Hedinger, would also be stepping down. This should seem familiar. When a game isn't performing well, the obvious first steps are to look at your workforce and attempt to cut them as much as you possibly can, to trim the fat, if you will. But if your CEO is feeling enough pressure that he resigns, that likely means he didn't think it was something that they could overcome with time, or probably thought the juice wasn't worth the squeeze, to go back to what I said earlier. And by all accounts, that assumption was right. Another year went by and it turns out that a free-to-play MMO publisher Gamers First and its development studio Reloaded Productions would be acquiring Fallen Earth in June of 2011, with full intention to convert the game to a free-to-play MMORPG. The previous year, Gamers First had done the exact same with another floundering sub-based MMORPG, All Points Bulletin, one we have coincidentally also covered on my channel. Gamers First would be relaunching Fallen Earth on Steam, complete with new content and expansion to boot. 
the free-to-play launch came in October 2011 and had a rather hmm, quiet relaunch. Reviews for the time as shown on Steam were generally good, and we know as of 2018 as many as 2 million people have played the game, but you didn't really start to see reviews come until December of 2013 where Gamers first teased a number of new changes, including a new area that was able to be built upon by players. With more players came more mixed reviews, however. Despite people trying their damnness to enjoy the game, even with its numerous changes and content patches, it still played like a game straight out of 2008. If you look at the games launching in 2012, 2013, it's no wonder that Fallen Earth was being slowly swept under the rug. Free-to-play numbers peaked at 1,052 players during the game's free-to-play reign, a minuscule amount of players. This never really changed. As of July 2018, Fallen Earth still exists, but barely in any capacity. Its peak players just yesterday were under 100 players. But that's not where the story ends. In a strange bit of news, only a few months ago, Little Orbit of Cartoon Network fame acquired Gamers First. This subsequently meant that they acquired both Fallen Earth and All Points Bulletin. But Fallen Earth's future was still quite unknown. When Little Orbit acquired Gamers First, they immediately announced great interest in revitalizing APB, partly due to GTA Online's big success. They expressed an interest in porting the game over to a newer engine, Unreal Engine 4. But the same wasn't really said about Fallen Earth. Well, up until this month, as of June 2018, Little Orbit came out and said that Fallen Earth had something special here worth rebuilding. Details, of course, are scarce regarding what this means, but since they own the IP, it's not unlikely they will attempt to see if there's another way that they can save or relaunch the game. I was excited about this news, especially with news of them porting over APB to a new engine, but I just hope the same could be possible for Fallen Earth, as I fear unless they implement a new engine, there's not much hope for the game no matter what they change in it. It's a lot to ask to play a game that came out in 2008 and plays like it came out in 2008, a game that brags a first and third person viewpoint as well. Not even big budget AAA games in 2018 can pull off a seamless transition between a first and third person game, let alone a game that came out nearly a decade ago. The reason old MMORPGs like Lineage, despite having quite dated gameplay and graphics, can continue to exist is because it has a rather simple engine that does exactly what it needs to do. Fallen Earth is a third and first person MMORPG with shooter elements. That alone is quite an undertaking. Not counting that the gameplay engine needed to be able to actually accomplish all of that. I mean, take a look at Bethesda's recently announced Fallout 76. Bethesda had no true multiplayer experience with a Fallout universe. Because of such, they had to ask their Fallout team to be essentially coached by their Quake Champions team in a way of porting the code over to a live environment. By all accounts, this was not an easy process, particularly what I was able to glean from watching the Fallout 76 no-clip documentary just recently. But then 76 isn't exactly a traditional Fallout game, now is it? <laughs> is it? Is it Larry? <laughs> so lonely. Little Orbit not only has to port their old title to a brand new engine, but also iterate on that engine. It may not be as difficult of a process as Fallout 76 went through, but one thing is for sure, it won't be easy. And Little Orbit has a tall order ahead of them in relaunching both of their games, APB and Fallen Earth. But they have sold all previous licenses and went all in. They're committed to this. I'm eager to see what they have in store for both games, especially Fallen Earth. You can see how polarizing the whole gaming world has received the new news of Fallout 76, as well as the recent acquiring of Fallen Earth. In the past couple of days, the game has gotten far more reviews than it had in quite a while. I think we are all excited to see how a Fallout-esque MMORPG could really work, just as we are excited to see what Little Orbit can do with Fallen Earth. Fallen Earth was really the first attempt at creating a Fallout game that was also a massively online multiplayer game, a Herculean task. It's safe to make a fantasy game, those are quite established. You can recycle aspects and give it your own spin. Same to some extent with sci-fi, though sci-fi is not as popular MMORPG-wise. Anyway, to capture a Fallout-style universe in an MMORPG, you have to make a game that is not only difficult, which already dissuades certain players from playing the game, but a game that also allows the true freedom you experience when playing a Fallout single-player game. That's not an easy task to give to a multiplayer game, where theoretically everyone can sort of do the same things. And that's why Fallen Earth had to really make sure to offer a plethora of faction options as well as customization. But Fallen Earth, as we know, had a fatal flaw. When the vehicle, the gameplay in this case, is working on a faulty engine, 
It doesn't matter how good the car looks or how fast the car goes. If the engine isn't stable, it won't perform consistently, and consistency is key. But this is a tough pill to swallow. Imagine you spent years upon years working on a game document. You came up with all of these ideas and were confident that it would work. But after launching your game, you realize that the proprietary engine that you created yourself, the tech, can't even keep up with your ideas. Oh lord. What did I log into? You can't just stop iterating on the engine. You need to fulfill your promises to your current audience. But in a depressing way, deep down, you know you can never truly satisfy the itch that they once satisfied. And thus, this is why failure is absolutely necessary in all things. We have to learn from those before us, and we have to learn from our own mistakes, and hope we can do better. The greatest teacher failure is. I applaud Icarus Studios for attempting such an ambitious MMORPG, especially with their perceived little resources. It's that kind of risk-taking that is desperately needed in current times to push the market forward. I don't want to say we won't ever see another Fallout-style MMORPG, a post-apocalyptic MMORPG, but Fallout and the idea of a nuclear-stricken world has been around for 20 years at this point, and yet we have only seen one true attempt at an MMORPG. I hope this changes. Maybe Bethesda's new Fallout 76 can scratch a little bit of that itch. But I'm not entirely convinced it will satisfy our desire for a post-apocalyptic MMORPG. I'm not convinced that Fallout 76's small player count can satisfy the massive aspect of an MMORPG. Time will surely tell, and I hope to be wrong about both of my predictions. But surely, a world of harsh conditions where humans are at both odds and forced to help each other to survive a nuclear-stricken wasteland full of morphed and mutated creatures Sounds as exciting to you as it does to me. Thanks for watching, guys.